Welcome to the unboxing and video quick start guide of the Lightwear MMX 4x2 HDMI USB 20L HDMI switcher with USB host switching functionality. Let's start with the box contents. You obviously have the switcher device itself that we will talk in a lot of detail. You get a 12 volt power supply, which always comes with the adapter kit. So this power supply is actually mounted with the EU plug, but you always have the appropriate plug for your country. You also get a three meter ethernet cable for ethernet connectivity. You get an infrared emitter and an infrared receiver. You get an eight pole Phoenix for GPIO connections. You get two times five pole Phoenix for audio connections, and you get two times three pole Phoenix for RS-232 connection. You also get two rack ears and four screws for those rack ears. And of course, some documentation, the quick start guide and important safety instructions. These are always a good place to start. And now let's talk about the mounting options. The switcher itself is half rack unit wide and one rack unit high. So you can attach two of these to a rack tray or with some editing magic, let me show you how the rack ears can be mounted. I have screwed in the two rack ears in two different positions. The first option is that if you want to hide this box, then you can mount the rack ears like this and you can attach the switcher to the underside of the table or any flat surface and then the box will be out of sight. But if you want to give users access to the front panel, maybe to allow them to see the front panel LEDs or do switching using these buttons on the front, then you can cut a hole for the front panel uh, inside the table and then you can attach the rack ears like this and then you can put the front panel through that hole screw it to the underside of the table and then people can see the status LEDs and use the buttons and access all these ports on the front panel. Okay, moving on to the connections and starting on the front panel. Here you see two three-pole Phoenix connectors labeled RS-232 1 and 2. These can be used to control this switcher from the Lightware device controller or any other third-party control system or these can also be used to control something else, a display or a projector, for example. Here we have a five pole Phoenix labeled audio in. So this is a balanced audio input. Next to it, we have two 3.5 millimeter TRS connectors. One is infrared in and the other is infrared out. Then we have a mini USB labeled control. So apart from the two RS-232 connectors, the USB is the second way to control this switcher from a computer. Then we have one of three RJ45 connectors. The other two are on the other side of the device. This port can also be used to control this switcher from the Lightware device controller or a third party control system. And we have three of these connectors because we can also share the ethernet connection with two of the host devices. Then we have feedback LEDs, four of them. The live LED is off when the device is not powered. It is blinking slow when the device is powered and the unit is operational, so it's like a heartbeat. And it's blinking fast when the device is in firmware upgrade mode and the LED is off when the device is not operational or not powered. The audio out LED is off when the embedded audio is not present or the analog audio output is muted. It is blinking when the audio format is not supported for audio de-embedding and this LED is continuously on when the embedded audio is present and it can be de-embedded. Out1 and Out2 auto LEDs are off when auto select is disabled on the HDMI output 1 or 2 respectively and they are on if auto select is enabled on the outputs. Then we have two buttons labeled OUT1 and OUT2 video select. And pressing these buttons selects a video source for output one and output two respectively. Basically you can scroll through the four inputs with these buttons. So input one, two, three, four, then move to auto select. And if you press it again, then you start from input one again. 
and the LEDs between the buttons are the visual feedback of what is currently selected for the outputs. If a specific output is selected, then it's either blinking, indicating that it is searching for a signal, and it is continuously on, meaning it is locked onto a signal. If auto select is active, then all four LEDs will be blinking until the switch has found an active signal on one of the inputs. Here in this tiny hole, you have the reset button. And lastly, on the front panel, you have a set audio config button. With this button, you can scroll through four different audio crosspoint presets. I'll put these on the screen and you can pause the video to see which preset means uh, what crosspoint state. Basically, the first three are switch to all commands for the three audio inputs and the fourth one uh, means keep the original audio in the HDMI streams and switch HDMI output to audio to the analog out as well. And now let's see the other side. In the top left corner you have the 12 volt DC power input. Next to it, there are four HDMI inputs for the four sources. These ports support HDMI 1.4 signals, so 4K3444 or 4K6420. They support CEC to control a media player, let's say an Apple TV, and the ports are HDCP 1.4 compliant. They have zero frame delay and pixel accurate locking. Each port has a status LED above it, and the LED is off if there is no signal, and it is continuously on if there is a valid signal present on this port. On the other side, you have two HDMI outputs for two displays. They have two status LEDs each. The signal LED is off when there is no signal switch to this output or the output is muted, and this LED is continuously on if there is an outgoing signal on the port. The other LED is labeled HDCP. It is off if the outgoing signal is not HDCP encrypted, it's blinking if the outgoing signal should be encrypted, but the connected SIM device is not HDCP compliant. In this case, the outgoing signal is completely red to also notify uh, the user about this problem. And the LED is continuously on if the outgoing signal is encrypted and the sync is also HDCP compliant. And in the top right corner, you have another 5-pole Phoenix, which is the balanced analog audio output. In the bottom, you have the, two, the other two RJ45 ports, as I mentioned earlier, all three ports support 100 megabits per second. Then we have an 8-port Phoenix for even manager functionality. Six of the pins can be individually set as input or output. The seventh is 5 volt and the eighth is a permanent ground. Then we have four USB 2.0 type A ports for peripherals such as keyboard, mouse, webcam or wireless presenter. It's a prototype enclosure, uh, so it's not visible here, but the first port can supply 1000 milliamps for webcams such as the Hadley IQ. The other three ports can supply 500 milliamps each. And finally, we have four USB 2.0 type B connectors for the host devices. A few words about the connection steps. Basically, you can connect the cables in any order you prefer, as long as they are not powered. So connect everything and then apply power to the entire system to make sure that there are no harmful voltages in any of those cables. The power up sequence, however, we recommend that you start at the display side and then move your way backwards to the source side. The reason is that some sources only read out the EDID when they are powering up, so if the source boots up faster than the connected device uh, downstream, then it may happen that you need to restart the source to make it read out the EDID again. But of course, most sources nowadays can read out the EDID even after booting up. So even if this device boots up after the source, uh, the switcher can notify the source to read the EDID out again, and you will have the correct resolution and refresh rate. All right, enough said. Let's power up the devices, let me quickly build a demo system and then we will fast forward to that. Alright, let's see what we have here. Don't be frightened by the cable mess. We have the MMX 4x2 as the heart of the system. We have one single display which is connected through one HDMI cable. We are using output 2 so that the connectors below are visible. 
Then we have some USB peripherals. Firstly, we have the USB webcam, which is connected to USB device port one. Then we also have a Logitech Spotlight presenter. Its receiver is connected to port number two. Then we have a USB keyboard and a USB mouse. I'm using wired connections, but this can also work with a unifying receiver or any wireless receiver. Then we have two source devices. One of them is this mini PC. We can consider it to be the room PC. So it's always there. If people don't bring their own device, then they can use this mini PC after logging in with their credentials. The PC has one HDMI cable going into HDMI input one. It has one single USB type A to type B cable. So we are using it as PC one or host one. And we also have an ethernet cable connected to ethernet port number two. Then we have our second device, which is a laptop. But instead of connecting three different uh, cables to the laptop, we can use a docking station. So this is a Dell docking station. It's actually a Thunderbolt docking station, as you can see. It also has the same connection. So one single HDMI cable going into HDMI input two. We have a single USB type A to type B cable going to port PC two and a single ethernet cable connected to ethernet three. So apart from these, we have an iPad where we can control which device we want to switch to the display. But the beauty of this device is that it doesn't only switch the video signal, it also has USB host switching functionality. So all four peripherals will be switched with the video signal at the same time. So right now we are seeing the image of the room PC Let's say we want to do a presentation. So we can use the presenter to click through our presentation. Then when we are finished, we can use the keyboard. As you can see, I can type in anything and I can also use the mouse. So I'm moving the mouse right now. If somebody wants to use their laptop, uh, let's say they want to do a Zoom call, so they have a soft codec on their laptop, but they don't want to use the internal webcam of their laptop. This laptop has the webcam down there, so it has a horrible image looking up your nose. So what they can do is go to the iPad, press one button. In a second, you see the image of the laptop and now I can also move the mouse and now I am controlling the laptop or I can press buttons on the keyboard and as you can see now I see the image of the webcam which is on top of the display. Once I'm done with my zoom call I can go back to the room PC and I can carry on with my presentation by clicking with the presenter. So again, four by two switch, which doesn't only do video switching, but it also has a USB host switching functionality. So if you have a laptop like this and you're using a docking station, then all you need to do is connect one single cable but if you have a device with traditional USB ports, then you can use one single cable for USB, one for HDMI and one for Ethernet. A few words about control. So as you saw before, we have an iPad which is uh, running a browser and it's connected to the IP address of the MMX 4x2. And this is the mini web that you can configure on our website. So if you go to www.lightware.com and go to the support tab, then you will find this uh, mini web configurator. 
and you can build your own system uh, with a few simple steps and then you will get an HTML file which you need to upload to the device and once you're done you can just type in the IP address in any browser which has access to uh, this 4x2 switcher and then you have this simple control. Then the other option is the Lightware device controller. So if you run the Lightware device controller, it will discover the MX 4x2 and then you can connect to it. And then you have control over the HDMI ports, the audio ports, uh, EDID, the control ports such as RS-232, GPIO, Ethernet, Infra and here you have the USB switch so this is where you can do the uh, host switching and finally you have event manager functionality and then you can go to settings where you have access to the status, network, backup and restore and all the system information. So that's the second way of controlling the device and of course the third way is using a third-party control system. Our protocol is completely empty, all of our commands are documented in our user's manual so anybody can uh, take that document and program their system to control the MMX 4x2 as they wish. I hope this video was informative. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to your sales representative or one of our support team members at support at lightware.com or your regional support address. If you would like to test this device yourself, then again contact your sales representative. We would be happy to provide a loan for you and then you can have your own first-hand experience with these units. As for now, thank you for watching and stay safe.